you know, this has hurt me. You know, I have ached uh, for the separation and the uh, just the just the tampering down of the work of the church during this COVID yes. pandemic. I have it. Just hurts. Yes. It's hurt me. And I'm so I'm so thankful that things are starting to wake back up again. And uh, I look forward to the days ahead with you. Uh, you know, Psalms 139, Bill, I, that's one of those psalms that every time I read it, I almost just shake my head uh, at, the, at the quality of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaking through David. You know, psalm 22 is another one that does that to me. Uh, it's one of my very favorite couple of psalms. I appreciate you singing and leading us in that. We've been in second, well, first and second Timothy for about four months, I think. And uh, today we're starting on the last chapter of second Timothy, chapter four. It's a, uh, it's been a long exercise. I didn't plan on being in these two books that long. It just sort of happened that way. I kept finding more and more stuff and I, I had to tell you about it. And so it, it, it kind of made the class last a little longer than I anticipated. But I hope it's been a blessing for you. Uh, as you know, uh, First and Second Timothy, Paul's in, in uh, prison in Rome, in the Mamertine prison, being held by the Romans, awaiting execution. And he's writing, this is his last letter, by the way, this is the last chapter of the last book that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. And he's, he's writing to this young Timothy, who's a uh, pastor there in Ephesus, uh, who evidently is going through some tough times. Uh, persecution, uh, trouble in the church, and different things like that. So he's, he's trying to encourage him and give him some guidance. So we're going to start in chapter 4, at verse 1, and see where, where we go today. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. <clears throat> I'm going to stop right there because there's quite a bit packed into that sentence. Uh, number one, I want you to, to notice what Paul is doing for Timothy there as he's telling him, uh, and he's telling you, who's watching. You know, sometimes we, we think we're alone. Sometimes we think we're going through things by ourselves. Sometimes we think because we haven't got a crowd of people around us, and we're, we're alone. Yeah. And what he's doing... Paul, in effect, is trying to roll back the eyes of Timothy to the spiritual world that's around us. Now, I know you guys know the stories in the Old Testament times where, uh, you remember that time that uh, Elijah prayed and, and asked the Lord to open up the eyes of his servant, and he looked up on the hills and he saw thousands of angel warriors? Yes. Roll back his eyes spiritually, so to speak. Well, Paul's doing that with Timothy here to tell him over there in Ephesus, he's not by himself, he's not alone, you're not going anything on your own. He says, number one, you're in the presence of God. That would be God the Father. Amen. You're in his presence. No matter where you are, wherever you are, whoever you're with, you're with God the Father. But secondly, you're with your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the one that's going to judge, he says, the, the living and the dead, and he's coming back. He's appearing, he says to us. So, Timothy's working over there in the presence of God the Father, the Creator, uh, Jesus Christ, his Savior, and this is something that I want to expand on just a minute before I go on, because that's not all. I mean, that's enough, I believe to be in the presence of God and be in the presence of Jesus Christ. But there's other verses in the New Testament that say something to this truth, and I want to share it with you. Uh, had to. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, he says, we are made a spectacle before the world. That's the word cosmos, by the way. It's not world like planet Earth. It's the universe. We are made a spectacle before the world before angels and before men. Uh, in other words, uh, you and I are, are uh, we're in a the theater. Think of it like that. that. That 
sort of sets the the idea in mind that Paul's trying to communicate. You're you're an actor, a player in a theater for the universe, for the world, for the cosmos. There are heavenly beings, angels watching. And we know that from other verses from Paul when he says that the, the angels desperately inquire and are curious to know the result of your salvation and your redemption. Hebrews 12 is my favorite of all. Paul talks about in there that we are surrounded by what? A great cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses. That means there's so many watching that you can't distinguish the individual faces. It's millions and millions of people watching. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So all of these things to Timothy, we're, we're in the presence of God the Father, we're in the presence of Christ Jesus, we're in the presence of the angels, Amen. we are spectators to the entire cosmos, Amen. it's watching, and furthermore, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I might add what I left out, I believe that cloud of witnesses includes our loved ones, and Ken, I would say Jerry is included in that number. She is a part of that cloud of witnesses that I believe are watching now. They've received their reward. They're in glory. And they're witnesses Amen. to our, our Christian life. So he says, Paul says, because of all that, you know, all these things going on around you that you might not even think about, not be aware of, I therefore charge you. Uh, it's a military term, charge. It means I, I am giving you orders. Timothy, this is, this is how it is. Because of all these things, I'm charging you. Uh, it's a strong word uh, that he uses there. It, it means a, a, a solemn testimony. It's like when you get sworn in to be on a jury and you have to raise your hand, place your hand in the Bible, raise your hand. It's a solemn testimony. I'm charging you, therefore, in the presence of God the Father and so on and so on. Uh, Paul's Paul's giving to this young man a truth that will comfort him no matter what circumstance he finds himself in, which happens to be persecution, by the way. Now notice, let's talk about Jesus. When we're together, we need to talk about Jesus. Amen. You understand? When we quit talking about Jesus, uh, we've lost the path. We're, we're off. Here he says, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who is what? He's going to judge the living and the dead. I think your King James says the quick and the dead. Yes. Living and the dead. Jesus is going to judge the living when he comes back at the rapture. He's taking the church up into the air will be with him. We'll sit at the judgment seat of Christ and review our lives. But he's also going to judge the dead. He's going to resurrect the dead in Christ at one point and later on the unrighteous dead when they'll all stand before the throne of God and be judged. Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. And then something that I love, and I appreciate this on Paul's part. He says he's going to judge the living and the dead and remember his appearing Amen. and his kingdom. His appearing and his kingdom, those are two different things, his appearing and his kingdom. The next thing that's going to happen with God's economy of prophecy is what? What's the next thing that we're looking for? Anybody? I heard it back there. The rapture. Nothing more has to happen in the prophecies of either the Old or the New Testament in order that the rapture might happen. You know what? We're not waiting for Israel to become a state. It's already happened. That was the last little trigger. And now that they're there, the next thing on God's calendar is the rapture. He's coming. And that's what his appearing is here in this verse 1. It's the rapture of the church. Now his kingdom is not going to happen at that time, right? He's coming for his church. They'll be caught up in the air to be with him forever. But there's a, there's a, a truth that we're taught in Scripture that after the great tribulation, he's coming back. And he's coming back to judge this world, to execute judgment upon the Antichrist and all the armies of the world that have risen up against Jerusalem. 
And he's going to judge them, it says, with the word of his mouth. And the picture that we get, it's going to happen very quick. He's going to speak a word. And the Antichrist, the false prophet, yeah. Satan, and all the unrighteous dead are going to be cast into hell. And it's going to happen fast. So at his appearing and at his kingdom is what he's talking about there, those two things. He's going to do some judging, and he's going to be the king of glory in his kingdom. You know, it's interesting to me. As I said earlier today, this is his last book. This is his last chapter that he ever wrote before his martyrdom. <clears throat> It's interesting to me that at this very point in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul still believes in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he believed it was soon. He believed it was imminent. He, he's been in the ministry now a little over 30 years and done a great deal. I think by some standards, most people would say he's, he was, apart from Christ, he was the greatest Christian that ever lived and what he accomplished. But in those 30 years... <clears throat> he started out preaching the second coming of Christ yeah. and he finishes with it here by his appearing and by his kingdom. Yeah. You understand me? He's still of the thought and the understanding that Christ could come before he's executed. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think of it like that? If you don't, I'd encourage you to examine your understanding of prophecy and understand that he could come at any time. Amen. Nothing more has to happen in order for him to appear. We might not finish this day. And uh, I'm ready for that. I'm ready. You know, it's, uh, it's called imminence. It's the doctrine that Christ could come at any time. And we believe in that. And we don't believe anything else has to happen. And the Lord can come. Now this word... In the verse 1, it says that who is to judge? I think your King James says he shall judge, right? That word really translated correctly from the Greek is he is about to be about judging. He's, in other words, Paul is saying, I believe it's close. When Christ comes and he, he's getting ready, I think we could say it as Texans, he's fixing yeah. To start judging would be the best way that Paul's trying to communicate. It's an active tense verb. It means it's real, it's coming, and it's going to happen. He's going to do it. He's going to judge. Now, verse 2, Paul says, Preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Preach the word. That's a that's a verse a lot of sermons have been based on. There's been a lot of a lot of pastors have used this verse uh, to explain what the Christian ministry is for a pastor. But I want to tell you something. This applies to every one of you. Yeah. It, it's not just a word for pastors. Preach the word is what Paul is saying. Number one, the word of God is to be the most important thing that comes out of our little mouths. Preach the word Amen. of God. It needs to be constant. You know, did you know in First and Second Timothy, by the way, there are 36 times that Paul refers to the gospel or the word of God. And 17 times he refers to the false gospel and the false word of God. Paul was preoccupied with the word of God, your Bible. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, right? We know that. It was codified and accepted as scripture, some of it before he even died. Yes, sir. They knew it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, here we are today, some 2,000 years later, and we've got the complete canon of the Bible, Old and New Testaments. We have multiple translations. We've got it on our phones. We've got it on our coffee tables. We've got it on our nightstand. We have the complete word of God. And it needs to be the most important thing in our life. It is the basis for our ministry, for our life here. Amen. You know, we're, we're here this morning in this class to build each other up. And you're doing it to me. And I hope I can do it to you. 
we're here to edify one another and encourage one another. But we're also here to reprove each other and rebuke each other and exhort each other and encourage each other. That's what I've uh, missed so much in, over these six months that we have not been able to do that face to face. <clears throat> well, Paul, Paul's saying here, this word preach, the word, it's an interesting word. And I bet if I, if I did a quiz, the image that you've got of preach the word, you've got the image of Pastor Drew up there behind the pulpit. Preaching away. Well, that's not really all that this word means. If you go to the Greek dictionary and look up preach, uh, it doesn't mean just to get behind a pulpit. It means to announce truth. Yes. It means to proclaim truth. It means to set it forth. Yes. It means to deliver the yes. truth. To make something known. That's just any Greek dictionary, you look it up, you can find that. Uh, and you know, it's, it's not something that you argue about. It's not, it's not debate. Uh, it, you declare it. You say it. Preach the word is, is something that we all do when we announce the truth to someone else. We, uh, we have got a golden age that we live in with the pastor, uh, the preachers behind the pulpit. But I'm telling you, if you delve into the Word of God and you study this Word, you'll understand Paul's talking to you. Yeah. He's talking to every one of you, as well as Pastor Drew. It's for all of us. It's a way of life for us. Uh, it ought to be done when we're having breakfast. It ought to be done in the, our office, in a car. It's something that can happen anytime, on the telephone. It's something that we can do in order to to share the word of God with one other person or more. Amen. That's that's what the word means. So I think I think what we what we have here is this. We are to preach, and I've clarified what that means. What? The word of God. That's what we preach. The word of God. The written, inspired, inerrant word of God. He's told us earlier, you remember back in this book when he told us to study, <coughs> to make ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed? He said that to you, didn't he? I know he yeah. said it to me. Yeah. He said it to all of us. And the, the, the reason for that study is so that we can all preach the word of God. We can all announce it. We can share it with somebody else. And then he says, <clears throat> well, he says, be ready. Be ready in season and out. This is the hard part. King James says, be instant in season and out of season. Uh, this is the hard part. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I would wager if we did a survey of, of all of us that you guys have got the content down, right? You've been in church. You've been in Sunday school. You've been in worship services. You've got the charisma, the gospel of Jesus Christ down. We've learned that. It's, it's in me. The hard part is to be instant, in season and out of season, to be ready at the drop of a hat to share the gospel with somebody when God opens up the door. Yeah. Right? Now, this, when it says preach the word, it doesn't mean go out and beat people over the head. It means when the opportunity comes, when God opens a door before you with somebody, whether you're on the phone or in person, be instant, ready to share the word, preach the word, if you will. Yeah. Have y'all heard the story about the Boy Scout that saw the little old lady on the corner of a busy street? And he, and he just, he was just overwhelmed, you know, with the danger of her fixing to cross that busy busy intersection. He went and grabbed her by the arm, held her tight, and walked her across that street. And then he got to the other side of the street, and she was a little miffed, and she turned to him and said, I didn't want to go across the street. You know? Well, Boy Scouts, they, they do their best, right? They try to help people. But preaching the Word, in my understanding of the New Testament Scriptures, 
is something that happens because, and I believe in this with all my heart, God opens doors before us when we ask him to. Amen. Notice I said when we ask him to. If you are sincere in your heart about sharing your faith, <clears throat> you'll put your feet on the floor in the morning and ask the Lord to give you open doors to share the word of God with somebody. I'm telling you, he will. It Amen. happens. Amen. It happens. There are people out there all around us that I believe the Holy Spirit is working on their souls to bring them to Christ. <clears throat> now, you might not be the one that actually shares the gospel and has them pray. You might be the one that sows a seed in their life that is reaped later. But I do believe this. There is never going to be one single person that you ever confront that the Holy Spirit is not actively involved in bringing them to Christ. You're never going to meet one. And if you take it upon your shoulders and it, it scares the, you to death to think about being a, somebody that shares the gospel with somebody, listen, friends, I'm telling you, you're not going to be the first one there. Holy Spirit is already there. Yeah. He's already witnessing to them. He's already trying to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's already there. And all we do is we're just, we're just coming along behind him being ready to preach the word in, in season or out of season, right? That's, that's what he's asking us to do here. And I don't find that to be necessarily a hard thing to ask. Yeah. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean that you abuse people and you, and you uh, are rude to people. It doesn't mean that you beat people over the head. It doesn't mean you've got the right to interfere with somebody's personal space. Yes. You can't save anybody. You can't. Yeah. I would if I could. I, you know, there's some people I just want to get them and just shake them <laughs> and say, why don't you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Why do you not love the Lord? Can I, it just, you know, if I could, I'd unzip them and I'd climb inside and zip it back up and accept the Lord for them. It's just, it's a mystery. But the, the truth of the matter is, we are to be ready in season and out for what? I believe it's for when the Holy Spirit opens the door for us to share the Word of God, the truth, the gospel of somebody. Now he says... <clears throat> When we share the truth with somebody, whether it's your family or a friend, sometimes you're going to try to convince them. Sometimes you're going to rebuke them. Sometimes you're going to encourage them. But do it all, he says, with long suffering, patience. And that's important. There's an old word in the English language, it's not used much anymore. <clears throat> it's winsome word winsome. To share the gospel in a winsome manner is to, uh, to take the back seat and present Jesus Christ in such a manner that people are attracted to him and they are drawn to him and not you. Yeah. That's winsome. To lift up the, the beauty of the Lord before people. That's what Paul's teaching here. And I believe we can do that. Amen. <clears throat> now, verse 3. For the time is coming and it's here. When people will not endure sound teaching, yeah. but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And so I'm leaving right now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This was written about 67 AD. All right, so we've, we've got about 2,000 years uh, added on to the time frame here. <coughs> And what he's telling Timothy is there's going to come a time in the last days when sound teaching will go out the window. They won't endure it, he says. People won't have it. They won't want it. What's going to happen to folks, to some folks, he says, 
is they're going to have itching ears and will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So God's truth here is that in the end times, I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't talked for six months and I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I'm going to have to get in shape. Um, in the end times, there will be a change in some churches away from doctrine and sound truth. Um, I can elaborate on this at will about how true that is in our world and in our country. Uh, churches that are more of a self-help circus than a place where the Word of God is, is revered and taught. Uh, now he says, these people that get these itching ears, look at verse 4. People that don't endure sound doctrine, what happens to them? Or sound teaching, what happens to them is they will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into fables yeah. or myths. So there's a consequence. <clears throat> there is a consequence. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Thank y'all. There's many examples of this that's happened in our day. Um, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to always go to Travis Avenue Baptist Church. <laughs> but here's the, here's the truth of the matter. You ought always to be a Christian believer that finds, commits, and serves a church that reveres the Word of God. That's the most important thing. We're in the last days. Last days before He comes. We don't have time for nonsense and silliness and things that don't matter. People are lost. People need the Lord around us. And it's important that we it's important that we take seriously our study of the Word of God. And I love I love you guys because I know you I know y'all and I know that you love the Word of God. <clears throat> and I have complete confidence when you're in the presence of lost people, you don't know what to do. These people are not that way. They do not want to hear it. They don't want to hear a sound Bible, Bible teaching. And will accumulate teachers around them that will teach them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. You understand? And so they're going to be led away into fables and myths. Uh, I'm going to give you a few examples of some fables and myths that exist in our, our day. It's always God's will to heal. It's not. I'll show you that next week. Uh, every believer has the same authority that Jesus does. I can command everything that Jesus commanded. You can't. It's God's desire that every believer is, is rich. That's a fable. If I have enough faith, I can have anything I want. That's wrong. That's a fable. That will not endure a sound doctrine is what Paul says here. Now, I think there's a reason for this. And I don't have time to go into all the <clears throat> things that I'd like to say about this, but A lot of times people don't want to hear the truth because they have to admit their own weakness and their own sin. Now I want a, I want a sound church around me that preaches the gospel. I want a sound church where people that are lost can come and know how to be saved. I want to, I want to be in a church where new, new Christians can learn and be discipled and be taught and brought along 
<clears throat> until they're strong and healthy as Christians. That's what I want. But it's not true for everybody. And there are some, there are some churches where that's anything but what they want. They're into social justice issues. They're into prosperity gospels. Mm. Uh, and all, all other sorts of things. I think people need to hear the truth. Yeah. And it's up to each one of us to encourage our, our, our pastor and our teachers and each other. Don't hold back on sharing gospel truth with anybody. You know, somebody once said, <clears throat> I think it was a song originally, uh, and I hate it, it says, uh, preach the gospel. It's attributed to St. Francis. Uh, preach the gospel by all me and by all means if necessary preach the gospel and if necessary use words yeah have you heard that yeah. it's by these people that want to want you to believe that you just got to live a Christian example before people and they'll be saved thank you Kim. Uh, I want to tell you something nobody has ever been saved except for the verbal written gospel of Jesus Christ that he was buried for our sins according to the scriptures that he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures there is no salvation apart from the gospel and it's always verbal yes well these teachers that Paul's talking about here do not want to hear it the people don't want to hear a teacher share the gospel truth I've been kind of negative here for a few minutes. I want to say something positive to you. I want to tell you that if you want to hear the Word of God, and if you look forward to hearing the Word of God, and, and you get up in the morning and you want to know a little bit about the Word of God, thank God. Because that's a sign of the Holy Spirit in your life doing that. Yeah. It is. That doesn't come from us. That doesn't come from our flesh. When we crave to know the Word of God, in whatever form, electronic or paper. It's the Holy Spirit that's urging you, that's prompting you, that's making you hunger for the truth of God. So if that's happening in your life, you have absolutely nothing to do with verse 3. You can just check it off right there beside it. <laughs> All right, we're going to go just a little bit further, and then I'm going to have to stop for this morning. <clears throat> Verse 4, they will turn away from listening to the truth and they're going to wander off into fables and myths. Yeah. Uh, somebody once said, when, when a man rejects God's truth, it isn't that he believes in nothing, it is that he will believe in anything. Yeah. Yes. And you know what's wrong with our society today, our culture? People have rejected the word of God and its absolute verbal truth and because of it, they're believing every man in what's right in his own eyes. There's no standard anymore. There's no moral truth. Uh, and we're witnessing the breakdown of a culture. We're living through the dissolution of the United States of America. And barring God sending his spirit for a, an awakening, a true revival, our nation is doomed. Because they pushed God out of our public life. They, they turned and wandered away into myths and fables. Yes. I'll tell you another fable. Evolution. Okay. People that believe that all this came by chance and that some molecules got hit by lightning and life appeared and here we are conscious, sentient beings. That's a baloney. It's offensive because it denies the creation story that God created the world in seven days. And he created people in the image of God. Amen. Man and woman, he created them. This is something that is a fable. And it's happening in our culture because people have turned away from the word of God. As for you, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Yeah. That's what we need. 
That's the word for all of you. Paul's, Paul's uh, talked about these people that are going to turn away from truth. Now he's talking to you. <coughs> you're here this morning. And I'm so glad. And I believe you're here because you wanted to be here. But I also believe you're here because the Lord wanted you to be here. Amen. I believe that he worked and led you to want. He fixed your want to be here. And I think it's a wonderful thing that finally we can be face to face with one another again. Uh, when we gather, the intent and purpose of our gatherings in Sunday school or worship or the ministries of our church is in order that we might practice what he's got in verse 5. To be sober-minded, to endure suffering, and to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill our ministry. Yeah. And notice he says, he says to Timothy that he is to be watchful in all things. I'm going to close with this if I may. Be watchful of everything. We don't live in a culture anymore when you can take things for granted. Satan and a great warfare, I believe, is happening in the heavenly places above our nation. We have to be watchful. We have to be on guard. Don't absorb what's what's happening around you. Don't don't be a sponge uh, by what you see in the media. If there's ever been a time when Christian people need to be watching and praying for the Lord and for our nation, it is now. Amen. I never thought in my lifetime, it's never entered my thoughts before. I lived through the Cold War and the threat about Russian nuclear missiles and all that. I never thought I would live to see the possibility of the United States of America following. But I do now. Yeah. It, it matters now what Christian people do. It matters what Christians do in prayer. It matters if Christians are watching the skies for the return of Jesus Christ. It matters that Christian people are on their knees and seeking God's face for our, our nation. And, I, you know, I am not a believer in setting up some kind of theocracy that America is God's Israel or anything like that. I don't believe any of that. But we are a Christian nation. We were founded on Christian principles. <clears throat> God has used us to send more missionaries than any other country in the world. God has used America to spread his word. And I think it's real important that we are watchful in all things. I know sometimes it's easy and you like to kick back, and relax, turn it all off and forget it's all going on. But I'm telling you, if you do, you're going to wake up and be sorry because we're facing a real enemy. Yeah. And I believe it's spiritual in nature. All righty. Well, I'm going to stop there and we'll start at verse 6 next week. Uh, Father, I pray this morning to thank you. Uh, God, I thank you that we can be back together in Sunday school. It has been a, a very tough uh, six months, Lord, and it's still tough for many of our, our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got many that are sick. We've got many that are isolated. We've got many that are con too concerned to come back. And we've got others that want to come back and can't. God, it's just a situation where we call upon your name. We ask you please to have mercy on us and take this virus from our land. Please bless the scientists that are looking for a vaccine. Help us, Father, to be found faithful and watchful in all things. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.